welcome everybody. If you have any questions, it's not a lot of us in the group at this particular time. You can just feel free to ask me like absolutely anything. And when I say my life is an open book, it really is. So I don't know how many of you may have been interested or are interested in writing a book, but when I first started and had the idea, don't think it's crazy, uh, whatever idea you have uh, in terms of writing a book, for me, it was a relationship gone bad. A lot of times it really is life experiences that actually motivate us to want to write. The most challenging thing I found at that particular point was it's almost impossible to fit creativity into recreating something. So whenever you're trying to recreate something, you're kind of limiting yourself. So I started that trying to put all my friends in and this person and my ex-boyfriend who was my guy at the time. And it just wasn't working trying to change names and all that stuff. So I threw all of that caution to the wind. I threw it out the door and I say, you know what? I like people with money. I like sex and I like drama. So I don't think I'm that different, but seriously, that's how I started writing uh, Soulmates Dissipate, which is my very first novel. You probably can see it back here on the bookshelf. These are all my books on the bookshelf. And um, it, it started out really well, really good, uh, very challenging. And I didn't know how to write a book. I just knew I wanted to write one. So I gave it my best shot. And I did some crazy stuff and I left out all the quotes and I left out, <laughs> the editor was like, who's supposed to edit this? Um, I said, I thought that was your job. And she was like, no, no, that's not my job. That's your job. So I say that to just say that it's not easy writing a book and it's okay to make mistakes along the way. Just kind of know what you want to write about and don't censor like anything, like anything um, that you're writing. And one of the things like a lot of people don't know about me is like before I started writing, I worked for the federal government for housing and urban development. I was a GS 14, 15, because if I'm going to do it, I'm going to get it. And so that was interesting to walk away from a secure government job, making that kind of money to actually write books full time. But for me as a woman, as a woman of color, you know, we're dealing with a lot of things right now in the media, but it's been going on forever, right? So when it was time for my 15, for my promotion, I say, I want my money. I gave him a 30 day heads up. Where's my money? Where's my office? Where's my parking space? Because you know, in the code of federal regulations, I read everything, I do everything. It's like, that's what I'm entitled to. And then all of a sudden I wasn't doing a good job. You're not doing that good of a job. And, you know, it's like, hmm, we're going to put you on a productivity improvement plan. And guess what? You got to write it. <laughs> I was like, right? But these things <laughs> happen. And I know a lot of people, men and women of all color, we're dealing with things on the job. But I feel like sometimes people of color really deal with some unnecessary things. It was no reason why I shouldn't have gotten my promotion other than the fact that I was going to be at the same grade level as the person who was my supervisor and she just wasn't having it. So, and, and she was a woman of color. <laughs> so, <laughs> sometimes we just get it from all angles. So I said, okay, no problem. I just start writing my book. I go home every day at five o'clock, right? And I start writing, working for me, right? Instead of staying till seven, eight, nine o'clock, you know how we do. I never mind being that person. I'm not trying to be the overachiever, but if a report is due tomorrow and it's not gonna get done by five o'clock or six o'clock or seven o'clock, I'm gonna stay until it's done. So, uh, but once they denied me that, I just started going home at five o'clock and writing my book like every day, those hours that I would have given to somebody else. I said, what do I wanna do? And I just started putting it into myself. And my supervisor at that time, he said, uh, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. He said, you really disappointed us and you disappointed me because I needed my report today and I didn't have my report. Okay, that's fine with me that you didn't have your report. And I let him go on and on and on and on. And so when he finished talking, uh, I just looked at him. I said, you can't have it both ways. I said, you pay me what I'm worth or you get what you're paying for. Right now, you're getting what you pay for. I said, five o'clock, you on the elevator, I'm on the elevator. You're going to see me on the elevator every day at five o'clock, getting my butt up out of here so I can go home and work for myself. Now, if you give me my 15, then I stay late for you. Because I know that's come full circle for you, just talking about your value and your worth, um, especially in your writing. 
Um, how has that been something that's kind of guided you as you continue to story tell? I haven't had any problems with Kensington or Grand Central. Those are the two houses I've written for um, since I self-published. But we have had challenges internally and I still know my self-worth. So if I have to speak up for myself, I'm going to speak up and say what I need to say. But for my characters, my characters, female characters are very strong. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people like in the book. And the characters are very wealthy. And that was intentional because I feel like people really should be wealthy. There's no reason why we shouldn't. We shouldn't have a mindset that we can't achieve, we can't get, we can't do. And, you know, just like Wellington in the first book, the major character, he was a financial advisor. He worked at home, he worked for himself, and he was very successful. And translating that to my personal life with my son, you know, I helped him. He did a lot for himself. He graduated from UC Santa Barbara, played basketball, came out with no student loans, et cetera, et cetera. But then I was like, well, whatever you want to do with your life, I feel like Black men should have their own. Think about what kind of business you want. You can work for other people, but you can still have your own business. Or you can just choose to throw everything you have into creating a business. So right now, he is an international award-winning children's author uh, with several awards and doing major, major things. So, you know, if you have kids, his website is jessiebcreative.com. I still look at us as a people uplifting bringing other people along. Um, people have asked me about writing a book. I do share my time. I do invest. I have a um, writer's group on Facebook. And I go in and every once in a while, I create a group within a group, right? And we Zoom just like this. And I answer their questions about writing a book. So if it's something you're interested in, feel free to message me. Um, let me know. And I'm going to pause for a minute because I feel like I'm a chatterbox, but I could be a chatterbox for an hour and some change. But I do want you to, uh, those who are listening, to get your questions in because, like I said, my life is an open book. You can ask me anything. You did mention um, your son's books. I know we carry, we have a couple of his titles in-house, and we do have several of your titles in-house as well, too. Thank you. Um, so I'll make sure that we pin that information at the bottom. So if folks want to, um, if they do want to check out any of those titles, we can put them on hold. You guys can pick them up from the library. Um, we're still doing curbside right now, but we'll definitely accommodate you the best we can. Um, this might be an unfair question, Mary, but is there a favorite, favorite book of yours? I, I'm sure you hear that all the time of all your writings. I know it's probably like asking <laughs> who's your, what's your favorite child? Who's your favorite child rather? Oh my God. Your favorite piece. You know, that is an unfair question. I'm just going to say that up front. But I will be honest that uh, my very first book, Soulmates Dissipate, I just love those characters. I really do. It's almost like a mom, right? Your first child and your last child. So the last book is the Careful What You Click For. Yep. This just came out in May. So that one's available. And um Soulmates Dissipate is a fan favorite, like an all-time fan favorite. And right now, we are working on a television series for Soulmates Dissipate, and we're working on a um, another series for the Rich Girls Club. That's a Honey Bee book. So those two, COVID has slowed everything down. It's like, oh my God, as soon as you get started taking off, doing everything, looking at people who are going to, you know, casting and stuff like that, COVID. So we're still working on those two projects and I am so looking forward to it. So um, the Rich Girls Club is supposed to be a mini series, kind of like Little Fires Everywhere. It yes. fits really into that. So, and I, again, I like strong women that um, also deal with reality and challenges. Cause I know like a lot of my girls that I talk to, I consider everybody my girl. So when I say my girls, I'm talking about everybody. Um, they go through relationship challenges that sometimes we think because we're so strong that we wouldn't mentally go there. Like no man could do this to us or no situation could bring us to this particular point. And I like for my characters to go through a lot of emotional things because it's real life. It's, it's what people deal with. 
you know, myself included, but not too much. Cause <laughs> <laughs> have you uh, had any type of uh, writer's block or anything during the pandemic or have you been able to stay creative? That's a good question. Um, I don't know if I would call it writer's block or procrastination. I just really get caught up sometimes. I need to do like my friend, I was talking to her <laughs> on the phone <laughs> not too long ago and she's a writer too. She said, Mary, I can't watch the news. And I get up and watch it, CNN and MSNBC and the local news and what's going on today. And before I know it, the day is over. So um, I don't have writer's block. I can pretty much write at any time when I sit down. I just need to know what direction my characters are going in. So I develop my book like four chapters at a time. So the book I'm working on now, I have to know what Zen is doing. I have to know what Sequoia is doing. And when I follow them, then I can know like the next and the next. But then sometimes somebody else comes in that I didn't put there insert self she doesn't even have a name she's just insert self right zen's mom and zen's mom wants to tell her story as to you know what she's been through the name of the book is my heart will love again so i feel like um a lot of times in the black community we don't necessarily have the level of freedom of love our love a lot of times is conditional and we bring so much to the table with it that people don't even think about, don't even consider. And just as a woman, period, of any color, it's like a number of us are dealing with rape and molestation and other things. And so I like to address a lot of different things. So I don't know what Zen's mom have to say right now, but I'm sure she'll tell me since she just showed up and invited her <laughs> to the party. <laughs> but they're real, and that's really how... Um, I develop characters. I'm also open to another character coming in or not wanting to go. It's almost like a spirit, right? If you believe in spirits. I do. I'm from New Orleans, so I believe in voodoo too, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> There's voodoo in this book because I believe in it. <laughs> yeah. Like yes. We have a couple questions that are coming in and just to remind you guys, um, I'll be able to ask questions. I know uh, Mary will be able to see them as well. Uh, Carla asked if writing has gotten easier for you the more books that you've written. Harder. And the reason why it gets harder for me is because I never want to get comfortable to be like, oh, I got this and just feel like I'm following a formula or people will love it because I feel like uh, with your readers, you really have to try to give them the most that you can give them through the characters. So it gets harder. Um, because you have to keep coming up with new ideas or new for me, right? We always say nothing's new under the sun, but to answer that question, it doesn't get easier because I always like to challenge myself with the next book and the next book. And then like this book is really going to be a challenge with my heart will love again, because it just encompasses so much with the characters mentally. All right. Brianna has messaged us, she says, or she asked, do you prefer advocacy work and endeavors as an entrepreneur or, or your work as an entertainer? Um, more as an entrepreneur. If you follow me on Facebook, <laughs> I'm serious. I am always uh, putting, putting something up to try to advocate for women, for rights, for justice. I talk about things that's going on. Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms, I love her, you know, and even something like the governor decided that he was going to drop the lawsuit. I said, no, his lawsuit had no merits. And so therefore it got, it would have gotten thrown out had he not dropped it. So he's just trying to make himself look good. And, you know, the Republicans are really trying to take Atlanta from, um, from black leadership they really are they're trying to from democratic leadership and flip it to republican because a lot of money is here and a lot of money is here in atlanta between film between the airport okay i'm gonna stop because y'all see <laughs> you get no me. you're fine He's no like, no i think you, you have us we're all we're here <laughs> so conscious about so many things and i realized even in love life relationships even talking about love, it's easy for me not to let somebody disrespect me. Like my um, ex-husband, when we were together, you know, I told him, I said, 
you know, the one thing that's an immediate divorce is if you put your hands on me. If you put your hands on me, I'm gone. I'm out. This relationship, this marriage is over. I said, I can deal with infidelity. I can deal with cheating. Because to me, cheating is something you did to somebody else. It's not something you did directly to me. I don't know why people go, oh my God, he cheated on me. I mean, okay, well, what's the real problem here? <laughs> what do we really have to deal with? You want to be with somebody else? Uh, you're not, what, feeling complete? You know, let's deal with those real issues as opposed to dealing with some other things that society tells us as women that this is a deal breaker for your marriage. For me, it wasn't. I can't speak for anybody else, but he put his hands on me once and I was out. I already warned him, so. And I was 21 when I got married, 22 when I had a baby, 23 when I was separated, and 24 when I was legally divorced. So what we doing, you know? So life is like that for me. It's like you make a decision and you stick with it. Like my dad, he said, as long as you make the decision, then it's yours and you can live with it. Even if you choose to stay and it happens again, or if it never happens again, then you made the decision. Somebody else didn't make it for you. So you feel better about making your own decisions. The thing is, is that you have to be willing to make your own decision and not let somebody else do that. So I've always lived my life like that. I have another question. Um, have you ever struggled with how your story comes across on paper versus the way you have it in your head? Yes. Yeah. Because um, sometimes I just want to get it out of my head, but then it's on paper. And then I'm like, this doesn't even sound right. Uh, this is not moving in the right direction. But the biggest thing and the biggest challenge, if you are a uh, aspiring writer, an actual writer writing, you know, cause writers write and don't worry about perfection in your first draft because you're always, well, for me, it's like, you're always going to go back and change it, alter it. The biggest thing is getting it out of your head. So no matter how crazy it sounds, get it out of your head. And for me also, I have always been one of those writers that sit at the laptop and I think, and I write, I think I write, I think I write, I think I write. And then I go back and I rewrite. However, for the very first time, this book, which my editor, Selena Jones, James, I'm sorry, Selena James said that she thinks is my best book. Um, in her opinion, I actually, but she could tell, she could tell. She, these editors are really, really good. Did you talk text part of this book? Yes. <laughs> I use dictation. <laughs> <laughs> is that a, like, is that a faux pas or is that a no? Is that okay to do? That's okay to do. Okay. I was going to say, I was like, is that a writer's faux pas that I'm not aware of? <laughs> well, you could actually do this, um, but you still have to create a great story. And I did it for the very first time. It's like, okay, well, so why on book number 29, right? For the very first time you want to use dictation. Well, I was involved in a car accident and another accident prior to that about three weeks before. And I really was like legally blind in my right eye, struggling to see out of my left eye. And I have a deadline for a contract that I've already missed. And at some point, I have to figure this out. So I say, Lord Jesus, help me, please. That's my saying, right? Lord Jesus, help me, please. <laughs> I call everybody, right? Help me. And uh, I'm serious about it. I believe in spirits. I was like, I need help. I don't know how I'm going to finish this book. And I was just stumbling across Word and doing something, and I saw dictation. <laughs> now, the dictation is very much like Siri, for those of you who decide to try it, if you're writing. Siri is always what misquoting people. Yes. <laughs> she says, it's just like I can't with you. So <laughs> you still have to go back and read it, but it helped me in two ways in particular. One to get it out. But if I know how my character sounds when he or she is speaking, I can speak very well in that tone as opposed to trying to get it from my head to paper. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. right. So don't, don't shy away from dictation. 
I got another question for you. We're, we're moving along to, um, is there anything you would like to write about that you haven't yet? I'm sure there is because there's always something to write about. I really want to transition from um, fiction to nonfiction. So I've done a couple of nonfiction books, Never Let a Man Come First, which is free, by the way, on Amazon. If you have Amazon, Kindle. Uh, Audible too? Huh? Audible as well? Um, I don't think it's free on Audible. No, it's not free on Audible because it's not available on Audible. Um, I self-published it, and I didn't do that audio side, even though Carol Mackey tells me I can. Um, she's over audio books. But okay. I haven't done that yet, but it is um, – available. Sometimes I lose my train of thought. I was like, what was I getting ready to say? What'd you ask me? Um, <laughs> is there anything you would like to write that you haven't okay. yet? So you said the nonfiction work and I, I you did uh, get a signed copy from you last year. And that was actually one of my favorite reads last year too. Well, I appreciate that so much. I do. And um, yes. So the next book I know I'm going to finished by March 31st, because my goal is to have it out by October. And as we speak, it is another nonfiction book and it will be self-published. The publisher sometimes, if they bring you on as an author for fiction, they don't necessarily want your nonfiction. Um, sometimes they do, but it's like so many different channels to get through to get that done. And I see some other authors like myself who's been published for quite some time, a couple of decades, are doing self-published books as well. So I Am Not My Breast is a book that I'm going to write. And uh, I've toyed with the title, but I've settled with that one. Um, the other title was Breast Cancer Saved My Life. So I was like, hmm, I'm going to do the I Am Not My Breast because it covers more of what I want to cover. And that's education. And I do want to speak on that more because birth control pills cause breast cancer. Because now you look around and you go, why are so many women getting breast cancer all of a sudden? It's like, I'm sure, or almost sure, everybody on this Zoom either knows somebody who's had breast cancer or has had to deal with it. That's how widespread it is. But it comes down to what we eat, our environment, like I said, um, contraceptives, there's documentaries on it, and different things like that that women don't know a lot of times until it's too late. Because I'm, I'm the health person, right? I take matcha green tea powder, chia seeds, flax seeds, you name it, and you tell me it's good for me and it's natural, I'm going to run out and it's probably on the shelf in my cabinet. So um, just having to deal with that, I was quite shocked. That made me breast cancer with a diagnosis last year. And once they said it, I'm like, okay, well, let's just take both. It's like, because this one didn't have it, this one did. I'm like, just take both because I don't want to come back and deal with this again. We're going to do a one and done. And even with that uh, double mastectomy, um, I'm still a very confident woman. So I go out like this if I have to go out. I have prosthetics. I do. I've never opened the box. I, I got to go back and revisit that because I wanted to donate the bras and the prosthetics that I have to a woman that maybe has to go to work or maybe doesn't feel complete because they're expensive. <laughs> you know, a lot of people have like two thousand dollars to spend on trying to look the part. You know, but for me, it's like you either like me or you don't. I'm I'm a hundred percent comfortable with who I am and where I am. But I've learned so much, and I do want to share the things that I've learned, and hopefully along the way help other women not feel like you are less than because you don't have or because you have been diagnosed. You can do, you can get through this. You can do this. Well, I'll be here for that as well too. Make sure to share with some of my folks. I have an aunt who's uh, currently uh, going through radiation right now, so. I know those will be some inspiring words for her as well. So, okay. Yeah. So um, 29 books is that where we're at now? That's working on number 30. Working yeah. on number 30. I know you have some um, YA or a young adult 
um, nonfiction too that you also promote, um, just kind of helping young ladies find their value and their worth too. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? That's more so in the nonfiction realm of the Never Let a Man Come First. And in the book, it's for younger women and for uh, mature women. I have two different versions. I have one I call my dad book. <laughs> <laughs> Blanks are dumb, you know, because that thing has no sense down there. <laughs> Can't think for himself. And so <laughs> I like to like shed light in that sense. But for the younger women in the Never Let a Man Come First book, parents cover a lot of information most times. But then we still have some parents that don't talk to young girls about the development of their body. Who am I? That's a basic, that's a simple question with a very complicated answer. Who am I? If all of us had to go around and share who am I, you would really have to stop and think about that. So I also talk about different types of STDs and what are the signs and symptoms of these STDs that you get? Because sometimes they may not know. Some of them, you know, like a, a, an odor can be a sign or you know, a symptom of some kind of disease that they may have vaginally and they don't even know sharing towels you know if you're a young girl it's like oh your girlfriend took a, a shower she used a towel you only have one towel let me use a towel i'm gonna dry off and you think nothing of it but if one person has something yes you can spread it from one girl to the next vaginally yes um from sharing certain things so i feel like it's that level of education and also like loving yourself i talk about the three rings the relationship ring the engagement ring the wedding ring and most people go a relationship ring what's that there are a lot of women who will never get married there's a lot of situations where guys feel like i ain't buying her no ring so if he said i ain't buying her no ring that tells you a lot about what he thinks about you and it's something to pay attention to and i talk about divorce and i talk about other things so you know, people have to make decisions for themselves and what they do. But I feel like the younger and the earlier that females get information that may not even be relevant today, but down the line, you're in the college dorm. Oh, yeah, honeybee said don't use that towel. So I'm gonna have to figure out something else, you know? I have Brianna. <laughs> she is here. She's joining us. Yes, hello. <laughs> Finally got in. I have two other questions, but then I'm passing the baton back to you because you are the librarian, ma'am. You are the expert at this. <laughs> Thanks uh, so for two other family. questions that we received. Uh, would you collaborate with your son on another book? And um, uh, many authors cross over to write teen books. Are you interested in crossing over to doing more teen fiction or nonfiction or fiction books? So two different questions. The one about uh, writing with Jesse on a project, and then the second one about um, becoming a YA or a teen um, fiction or nonfiction writer. Um, those are excellent questions, by the way. Um, I don't get those questions a lot, but they are excellent. And so for Jesse and writing a book with him, absolutely. We have actually, we have two projects that we are considering writing about is just finding time between his schedule and my schedule to actually write the book. Uh, one is 18. So that's one of the books Jesse and I are working on. We've done a synopsis for it. We've done character development for it. And it really talks about teenagers. So I guess that kind of answers the next question a little bit but it talks about the whole teenage world of kids like graduating from high school and going on to college and all of the struggles that they have to deal with um, internally because people think it's like so easy for them and a lot of times it's not easy for teens um, with making decisions so 18 goes into that, you know, one girl, she's U.S. born, but her parents are immigrants. So she has to be careful about everything she does because she doesn't want her parents to get deported. And we are dealing with the, the athlete in school where the dad is just really wanting this child to um, be this superstar, right? So he's really hard on, on his son. And then we have the activist kid who's always, you know, we have a lot of young people now that are activists that 
that's out there cheering for people. And then we have the kid who got the bad rep, you know, um, for doing something that he didn't do. So the activist jumps in and that's how we begin to intertwine the different characters to support one another. And so I won't tell you about the major event that happens that brings them all together, that makes them like um, bond. And they end up going to the same university, but even at the university, you see all the separate problems that they have uh, going in. And I think that's important because I think that a lot of teenagers do get overlooked in terms of the issues that they really have to deal with. <clears throat> I even um, had a chance to speak to some young ladies at Jack and Jill in Martha's Vineyard like year before last. And it was really quite amazing hearing what they had to say and speaking in front of the parents because people were like, oh, don't let the kids go in and listen to Mary because, you know, Honeybee got a lot to say and she's so sexual and this and that and, you know, with the content and I know how to speak to different audiences. And so when the moms came in, um, if I start off saying like, okay, um, I've been molested, I've been raped, I've been physically assaulted, I've been, and then I open up about my life, my story, and I share, and I say, I don't know how many of you have had to deal with that, but we take that with us where we go. And when you have daughters, and then they started saying, wait, wait, my daughter needs to be in here. And so they asked the daughters to come in. So it was about 16 girls that came into the conversation. And when, when your daughter confides in me something that she has never told you, and I have only talked to her for an hour, and she feels comfortable enough, it says that we need to have better conversations and no judgment. That's all they want. They just don't want to be judged. So, you know, she shares some very important things. And I told her, you know, different things about that. And I also have something that I call safe, safe sex alternatives, because I feel like if a girl is in a situation where she does not want to be intimate with a young man, she doesn't have to be. But there are different levels of intimacy where you can still keep your virginity and you don't have to accommodate. But see, we have to talk about those things because what's the alternative? If you're not open enough to maybe have another alternative, it may cross over into that rape situation because he's determined to get what he wants. But if you have a smart girl who can get out of that, and maybe, you know, whatever, but she can take care of the situation. So it's so many different things in life and safe sex alternative is no penetration and no contact like that. So, so how do you do that, honeybee? <laughs> honeybee. <laughs> so, but it's so much I feel like I just need to teach. So I need to stop writing so many books. And then as far as the YA, I haven't thought it, that's young adults. I haven't thought about just writing um, for them, but then when you brought it up, I really am thinking about that 18 series is definitely YA. So, yeah. So we have Frank who um, is wondering, what do you do whenever you get inspiration, but you can't really write down the idea? Uh, maybe you're driving or uh, it's just a random thought that might spark, you know, a new book or a new plot. Um, how, how do you keep track of that? Okay, Frank, that's an excellent, excellent question. Now, different authors function different ways. I'm going to answer that in just a second. For some people, they keep a journal with them. So if a thought comes up, the first opportunity they get, they'll write it down. Some people, if they're at dinner, they'll write it the, down on a napkin, at least enough to remember what that thought was. Um, other people will use their voice recording on their phone to record what it is that they want to remember that's relevant. For me, I believe 100% that I will remember what it is that I am thinking about. And as soon as I get in front of my laptop, I forget. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And that's the truth. That's the way I work. And I could be in the bed in the middle of the night because thoughts come to you in the middle of the night. And it's like, ah, oh, that's a good one. And I'll be like, okay, I'm going to remember. And, and right now I'm thinking I had a good thought last night. 
and since I'm asked this question, I can't remember what it was I was going to say, and it was very clever. So I'll just have to wait on the next clever thing that comes up. So I do not write it down. I don't. Whatever comes up comes out when I'm in front of the laptop creating. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, and forgive me if you already covered anything um, since I did join a little later, but um, where do you find yourself getting most of your inspiration? Is it from the everyday things that you might encounter, um, you know, just doing errands or is it usually music or, you know, something else altogether? For me, I look at it as a third, a third, and a third. So a lot of what comes up is just creativity when you're just creating something. And then I do a lot of research on things that pertain to the book. And other stuff is just life experiences because if I've experienced something and it made me feel a certain way, then I can use that in the story. I don't write about my family and friends and stuff like that, but I do write about situations. So if somebody was to tell me something that sounded interesting, I'll go, hmm, never really thought about that. Let me look into that, you know, or if I personally experienced something like online dating, when I wanted to write a book about online dating, which is careful what you click for, then I started online dating. It wasn't something I was doing actively. And I tell people I was so disappointed when I started doing online dating because I really didn't meet these guys that I kept hearing the horror stories about. <laughs> these guys were fantastic. They had money. People who know me know I, you can't pay for the date. Don't take me out. So um, I'm just very candid and upfront. And I met a number of nice guys through online dating. Now I did meet some other guys that was kind of like, so, you know, it's like, hmm, you're interesting, but I don't want to go out with you again. Or some people you talk to them on the phone and you know you don't really want to see them. So I do do research in that regard and apply it to what I'm writing about. But careful what you click for, sheer entertainment. Do not read this book, Figuring Out How to Online Date. You have to talk to me about that. This book <laughs> is sheer entertainment, but it's still about online dating. Okay, that's really interesting. Uh, what would you say is the most um, interesting time you've had when researching a book? Because uh, you've written uh, over 26, so I'm sure you've had to research some, some wide uh, subjects. Absolutely. So, hmm, I, I know there's a few in my head. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what's good enough to share. Like, <laughs> lean enough. Because <laughs> I will um, get into certain situations just to figure out, like, how this is going to turn out. And I go to different places. I travel. I might even go somewhere where I wouldn't ordinarily go. And I know that's not like a direct answer. It's very indirect. But if you're asking about experience, I can say I went to adult clubs to write sexcapades. Because if I'm going to write this book, I got to know what people are doing. Like, what are you doing out there? Um, Sometimes it's just a matter of maybe attending a group meeting that I would not ordinarily go to in that particular situation. But if I'm invited in, you invite me, I'm coming. You may not know why I'm coming, but I am there. So I get to see things from a different perspective. It may even be taking a job, but I don't really want the job. I really want to know what people do when they're at this job. So <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, I've had people say, we know you spying on us. You don't need to be here. <laughs> yeah. 
then it's okay, right? <laughs> so I think writers do things like that. I think Eric Jerome Dickey learned how to ride a motorcycle when he wrote Destiny. It's like, you need to know what that was like. I'm not going to do that. My, my um, balance isn't that great. I'm not getting on a motorcycle. But I understand it. We do things like that. I had one friend who went to AA meetings, and she went to <clears throat> also meetings for people with six, uh, sex, sex addictions. And, but she wanted to know what it was like. It wasn't like she was an addict, but if you're going to write about an addict, you have to go in. And she really had to emerge herself into it so she didn't seem like she was spying on people. <laughs> so. We will do a lot of things to write a book. Well, I will. <laughs> right. I was going to say, you are one of the most popular authors we have at our library. I um, can barely keep your books on the shelf. And I think that one of the um, biggest things that people do like about your books is that they do read as so authentic. You can tell that, you know, you do know what you're talking about whenever you go to all these different um, settings in your books. Yes, I do visit locations too. Um, if I'm in Los Angeles, I'll, I'll start writing about a book. I started writing a particular book and then I um, put different places in there because you can look a lot of stuff up online, etc. And then when I actually got to LA, I found out that the sushi restaurant that I was talking about across the street from another place was being torn down and something else was going up. So I was like, oh, I gotta change that. So I had to at least put that much in there so people wouldn't read it and think, oh, that place is not there, you know? Right. Yeah, really interesting. Um, we actually have a question from Mike. Uh, he wants to know what book would you recommend to someone uh, who's never read you before? What would you want their first impression um, of your writing to be? Which book? Um, that's an excellent question, Mike. So I would say, I, I often say Single Husbands, which is a honeybee book, is very interesting because it's totally like different perspectives in there with characters. And also Soulmates Dissipate series, really, really good. And so Soulmates Dissipate would be the first book in that particular series. And that's a Mary B. Morrison book, as well as If I Can't Have You, first book in another series, and Single Husband. So I know that's three, but they're all very different. If you're looking for more of the romance um, ups and downs between a couple, that's Soulmates Dissipate. For If I Can't Have You, it really is a situation where you have characters who, without giving a story away, um, they challenge each other. The women challenge each other and somehow the guy is infused into a situation that actually elevates and elevates. And what was, what was really interesting to me was that I've had men come back to me and say, oh, I know a male character that's just like Granville. I'm like, really? <laughs> but Granville was developed off of a guy that I really met. And I was like, he's interesting. Like, I'm not gonna write about him per se, but this personality I have got to put in the book. And then single husbands is really just guys who got married because men marry for the wrong reasons sometimes too. And so it's three guys who marry for the wrong reasons. And then you see how that turns out with each of the guys. Like maybe they shouldn't have gotten married or they should have taken it more seriously or something like that. And I've done a stage play off of Single Husbands as well twice that went over extremely well, especially with the guys. Because most men go, oh, I usually don't like stage plays, but this was amazing. But of course it's going to be amazing. I did it. And I don't like to mail bash. So I just present situations. And either the situation is one where people are going to say that the guy is no good. But I don't say that because I don't believe that when I write it. I think people are just people. So I think that's where a lot of people found um, the stage play to be interesting. Oh, that um, is a great segue for my next question. So 
it looks like you've had one play adaptation so far of Single Husbands. Um, did you like doing that format? Would you consider doing that for any of your other novels? Okay, for Single Husbands, it was actually just wonderful. And I had so much excitement, enthusiasm, um, education, just from working with thespians, like on a daily, I was there every day, like at rehearsal, everything, every day, every day, every day. And then uh, feeding people on set, I would always make sure we had something where they could eat, something they could drink. And it was like, nobody does this. It's like, why are you doing this? I said, because I don't want you to have to leave to do anything else. But I would love to do all of the Honeybee books as a stage play because I love writing for adults and I love pushing it to the edge without going over the edge because it's okay to have adult entertainment. Every stage play doesn't have to be um, Christian based or the gospel songs. And I love those too. And Hamilton is one of my favorites, it's just brilliant. But to answer your question, absolutely. All of the Honeybee books would be great for theater. Now, um, do you see um, a lot of differences between being an executive producer for say a film or TV adaptation versus a uh, play adaptation of your work? I am new to being an executive producer for film and television. So this, whichever one comes out first, whether it's the Rich Girls Club or Soulmates Dissipate, which I believe it will be Soulmates Dissipate, I look forward to just like I did with the stage play of being on set every day being there, seeing what's happening. And I'm working with a great um, producer on this, uh, Howard Gibson. They just did, um, what was this show they just did? Double Cross, that's on UMC. He made his debut for directing. His sister Crystal has been out there for a minute doing different projects, film, et cetera. But the great thing about working with Howard is that he is like, whatever you want to do, let me know. He said, and don't um, rule out directing. He said, because once you are on set and you get to see how a lot of things go, it's your work. So you know what you want to see on film. He said, you'll get to shadow, you know, you'll get to shadow everybody. You get to shadow the showrunner. Um, of course, I'm the creator. So I'm looking forward to all of that. COVID kind of stopped everything. Uh, slowed it down a lot, but I'm looking forward to being an executive producer and, and making a name out there because there's enough room for a number, a number of us. Because I always get the question, have you talked to Tyler Perry? The question is, have you talked to Tyler Perry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because Tyler does Tyler. And so maybe when Tyler starts branching out to do some other people or looking to collaborate, and I can't say he's not doing that. I haven't seen it out there because everything is Tyler Perry Presents. And I am mad at him because he has built himself up from just basic, basically from scratch to where he's at. And I have enough content. I just need to work with the right people and have the same thing happen. Definitely. I mean, you, you do so much. So you have a podcast and you have the Honey Bee Morrison show. Uh, you know, you write novels um, and nonfiction. Is, and you, you know, want to direct. Is there anything else that you, you know, have your eye on, you know, in the future that you might like to dabble in or try out? any other medium or uh, role in entertainment? Well, so far acting, I thought I wanted to do that. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> when I did the stage play, I did it in Oakland, Single Husbands. And I also did Single Husbands in Atlanta. And I was going to play the mom in the stage play uh, myself, right? Cast myself into the mom role. And then, I don't know if you're familiar with the actress Donna Briscoe. She's on Greenleaf and she's done some other things. 
Well, Donna shows up. And so I fired myself. I'm like, you fired. Because <laughs> people who really do this, I think like, it's one thing to say, oh, I think I want to act, you know, but for people who really pour their heart and soul into this, I had to think twice about that role. So I'm not going to be doing that. Maybe a cameo where I don't really have to speak too much or something like that. Um, the other thing that I'm looking forward to is getting my nonprofit up and running where we are really helping people, helping women on a daily. I haven't done that yet. And so in order to step into some of these other roles, I have to let go of being in front of the computer all the time writing books, right? So Healing Her Hurt is my nonprofit organization and it's designed to do just that for a lot of women who are suffering from hurt and breakup and other things that happen. It's like somebody has got to put help put and I'm not saying that nobody does that because I, I don't like when somebody say well nobody else is doing it you won't hear that from me but I feel a responsibility to some degree to help as many women as I can put their lives back together emotionally because you know a lot of women are suffering emotionally right um I saw that you had that nonprofit. do you have any um, big projects uh with that that you are putting together for the future that you would like to do with the nonprofit, or is it more focused on um, smaller projects, individual by individual? I am not currently, let me say currently as we speak and I'm talking right now, have anything in the works for the project, like something that's coming up, but I do need to get back to what we were doing, which is hosting um, events. The events go really well in a sense that women come. And here's the other thing um, with Healing Her Hurt. It's an organization for women, but we really, really want to keep our focus on having it funded by men and corporations. And the reason why I say by men it's because a lot of guys will say, well, I'm not that person. I've never done that to a woman or blah, blah, blah. And that could be true, but it's not true for everybody because it's too many women who have gone through certain things. So maybe it's not your, your um, significant other, but maybe it was your mother uh, and you saw it, or maybe it was your cousin, or maybe it was somebody else that you knew. So the thing is, is to bring pride in the whole situation for men feeling good, for helping women, and for women feeling great about themselves so they can get back to having a healthy relationship with a man. Oh, okay, that's so great. Now, are, have you found yourself um, becoming you know, more invested in perhaps like the Me Too movement um, since that has really gained a lot of traction and it seems um, in line with your, your female advocacy? Um, work? I support the Me Too, Me Too movement, but I have not actively gotten into the Me Too movement to say, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to take on this role, I'm going to take on that role. Um, that I have not done. And I won't say that I won't do it because I feel like the Me Too movement is extremely important and another movement that should not, should not phase out in any sense of the word because it still happens. So women still need to have that support, but I have not personally joined in the Me Too movement. Of course, I put up posts and I talk about it like that on my social media, but if you say um, join a local branch of it or get involved in that way, I haven't done that. And I'll say yet because I don't know um, if that's something I will jump, 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 jump into. But I feel like what is happening there is also a part of healing her hurt. And so since we have to choose what we actually get involved in, one of the things that um, I need to talk about more and will, and that's, I wish we didn't have COVID, right? I, I can just say that. Voting is so important to me. I've been voting since I was 18, since as soon as I could register to vote. And I've never missed a major election. I can say that in terms of voting. So 
for me, I would like to jump into that aspect of it in terms of making sure people vote, vote, vote. So you'll be seeing a lot more of that as we get closer um, to election day. I've been talking about Kamala Harris since she, yeah, go. I was so excited. I know a lot of people were like, ah, I had somebody else in mind. It's like, look, what's the alternative? Okay, get over it. <laughs> it's like, and that's how I feel because, you know, we have to stand up for the things that we believe in. Even my shirt, I don't know if you can see it too well, but it's definitely a Be Woke vote shirt. So, um, I have different versions of that shirt too, because I, we just have to get out there and do it. So it's like one thing at a time, if that makes any sense. Um, and when I say one thing at a time, it's always more than one thing at a time, because I'm always writing. But yes, there's a lot for me to get involved in. And um, when President Obama won, it's like I just, I had to be a judge at the voting poll nothing else would do. <laughs> it's like, and make sure I'm there all day to make sure people's votes are getting counted. And I honestly wish I could do that today. That's what I would really like to be more involved in. If you oh, weren't. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Now, this kind of uh, ties into what we were talking about a little while ago. But on the topic of writing uh, with a perhaps younger audience in mind, you know, those teen girls, um, do you think that you could branch out even further and discuss all of these, you know, social justice, uh, political um, type of ideas in a book with them? Or, you know, just do further advocacy work with, you know, those younger, um, that younger demographic? Absolutely. And that that's a good... Um situation or topic to bring up in terms of doing something like that. And I say absolutely because I did a book, it's called The First Stories from the Imaginations of Sixth Graders. And I went to, this is when I lived in Oakland, the public school district, I went to the administration office, I talked to different people. And I said, look, I would like to do a book with a group of sixth graders and they were like okay and then they may have read something about what i've done i read my work and go oh no we can't have you <laughs> like no that's too much of a liability and i just said okay so then i went to the catholic school and said i would like i mary honeybee morrison new york times best-selling author would like to do a book with a group of sixth graders. And, oh, sure, come on in, come on in. And so it really went well, and I had everybody sign. Um, their parents had to sign, saying it was okay for them to contribute. All 33 sixth graders contributed, and the book was amazing. And I donated 100% of the proceeds. I paid for the project, but donated 100% of the proceeds to a nonprofit. So, my thing with doing that was that I felt like we have some budding writers and kids that love to write and may not know it and may not realize how great of a storyteller they are. And, you know, the teacher really saw the value in the project. And one kid was like, I'm not even into this. And he said, uh, I'm just going to write the shortest story ever. So he wrote a story that was 500 words, which is <clears throat> two pages, double space. So his story was 500 words. Along comes the newspaper and say, oh, this is a great project. We need a story that's 500 <laughs> words. I laugh because if all he wanted was 500, I didn't push him to write 600 or 700. If you can tell your story in 500 words, do it. But he was the only one that got into the newspaper because his story was a, a perfect fit. So you just never know. And um, I just remember that class very, very well. And I remember it was a group of um, six young black boys in that class. And at our first signing at Barnes and Noble, it was a huge signing. And one of the things they said that they did was writing made them bond closer together because they did not realize 
that they were dealing with a lot of the same issues. And they said they had become very good friends as opposed, uh, you know, from writing the book as opposed to not knowing each other very well when they started. So I think things like that, when you get to critique other people's pages and you see what they're writing and they were all positive, there was no negativity in the, crea in the critiques, it was just support. So I feel like, yes, that would be wonderful to do a project with, uh, um, based on advocacy and, and students who want to be activists and finding out where their heart is and what they feel about it and, you know, boys and girls and putting everybody together to do such a project. Yeah, so that would definitely be something that I would consider doing again and um, support. I would do it the same way. I would fund the, the publication of it, but also donate 100% of the proceeds, proceeds to a nonprofit organization. Oh, that would be a wonderful project and um, definitely something, you know, to, to keep an eye out for from you, you know, hopefully one day in the future. Um, I want to open up the chat for any uh, last questions. Um, we have gone, you know, a little bit over the hour and I thank you, Mary, for being so wonderful and so great. Um, we definitely learned a lot. And um, before we end things, um, I do want to um, just mention that Mary did have a book that came out in May called Careful What You Click For. Um, we do have several copies um, at our library along with all of her other titles. And I would encourage everyone to check her out because she's um, really popular and a wonderful writer. And I was wondering um, if you could maybe tease a little bit about what your next book might be about. Oh, okay. So I'll keep this shorter because I know I can be a chatterbox. Um, <laughs> the next book, I talked about it a little bit earlier, but My Heart Will Love Again really has to deal with the African-American Black love or lack thereof, because I really looked at it from an author perspective, thinking and feeling like the black man in America has never truly been loved or accepted. And that's why we are where we are today. But what impact and effect does that have on his decisions that he makes on a daily or his ability or inability to trust and not be vulnerable and fall in love 100%. And also for the black woman, trying to be that person that's there, that's supportive of the black man. She also deals with her struggles, again, in America that has all these limitations. So how can we as a people um, truly love one another without feeling like we're being judged or not feeling like uh, we have to accept less because I find that if black love is truly thriving and people are happy, even sometimes in the black community, it's like people aren't really happy for you. It's like everything with a husband always good. Everything, you know, it's like, can you always be good? You know, things like that, but why can't it be? And we are better together. So that's the book that I'm working on now. Oh, that sounds wonderful. We're definitely excited for that to hit our library shelves. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, it um, ebooks, because I know, like, here in, in Atlanta, and because people may or may not know, you can actually check out ebooks here, <laughs> here in Atlanta. Yeah. So, we have uh, ebooks available through uh, Overdrive, and we also have audiobooks and e-audiobooks. So we have uh, your work available on several platforms, both uh, physically and digitally. Thank so, yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, of course, like I said, you are a very popular author here. <laughs> Anna, we also have several e-books um, of Mary's on, um, on Hoopla too. Oh, yes, we have yeah, uh, Hoopla yeah. available. And actually yeah, the newest have... is on Hoopla as well. Newest, yeah. newest title. 
we do have a few different um, e-media platforms. So thank you, Ashley, for mentioning those. Yeah, definitely. So it looks like uh, we don't have any more questions in the chat, but I just want to uh, thank you, Mary, again, for being a wonderful uh, speaker tonight. We are thrilled to have you. And I hope that uh, everyone here uh, learned a lot and had a great evening as well. Thank you, Brianna. It's been my pleasure. And people can follow me on any of my socials at Celeb Honeybee, which is C-E-L-E-B-H-O-N-E-Y-B, or my website at MaryMorrison.com. All right, sounds great. And I think uh, with that, we will end everything. So have a good evening, everyone.